This week, we're picking up where we left off part two in our four part series on Mazda. And guess what? Ladies and gents, we're covering the rotary in this one. If you like cars that sound like pigs, if you like RX-7s, if you like Cosmos, not, not the, the drink, drink, Carrie Bradshaw, yeah. <laughs> but, if you, but if you like Mazda becoming uh, the car company that we know it as today, uh, make sure you keep on listening. All right. So without further ado, part two, Mazda, the rotary revolution. Huh? <laughs> It's October 1963, and the 10th Tokyo Motor Show is underway. Toyo Kojio's Mazda brand has had some success in recent years, following the launch of their first car and a new line of pickups, but the company is at risk of a forced merger with a larger company by the Japanese government. To prove its worth as an independent business, Toyo Kojio president Suneji Matsuda has hedged the company's future on a new pistonless engine technology that many consider to be a fantasy. Over the past few years, the company has spent enormous sums of money on a research project led by engineer Kenichi Yamamoto to work out the engine's flaws. A crowd is gathered in the Mazda team's small exhibit of trucks and K-cars when, to the surprise of both the crowd and the Mazda team, a car is seen approaching with Suneji behind the wheel. It's soon revealed to be powered by the so-called fantasy engine. Critics are stunned, journalists are buzzing, and the Mazda team now has more pressure than ever to get this car into production. How did Suneji Matsuda take Mazda from a small truck manufacturer to respected car maker during one of the most competitive times in history? How did they take an engine technology no one believed in and use it to save the company? And how did Mazda create two brand-defining cars in barely more than a decade? Well, today on Pass Gas, we're gonna find out in part two of our four-part series of Mazda. I'm trying musical hands today. That's good. <laughs> nice. That's that's yeah. rule number one in podcasting Just is use your hands. Frame the face. Frame the face. <laughs> Nolan is using his hands yeah. to great effect. You're just going to have to ever, imagine it. Yeah. Do you guys ever do musicals in high school? No. Yeah, I did one. Yeah. What was it called? Robert and Elizabeth. Robert and Elizabeth. Uh huh. Wow. No one is so animated. It's amazing. I've never heard of that one. Dude, he's inquiring. Yeah. And I really feel like he's curious about what I ought to say. Please tell me. Holy oh, shit. Wow. 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 Oh, my God. Locked in. Just right into my soul. Locked in. That's locked in. That's oh, locked my in. God. Wow. No yeah. hands there, but yeah. still no, fierce. But still, I don't feel like you use hands to lock in. What's I, Robert and Elizabeth about? Robert and Elizabeth is about, it's like seven brides for seven brothers, I think. Okay. So it's like a big, two big families and they're all the kids are hooking up. I see. Um, and I was not interested in doing the musicals, but I did the other plays. They didn't have enough guys to do it. Yep. So the director called me and was like, hey, like you don't have to audition. Will you just wow. come play some parts? That's cool. And so I did. I played a bunch of little bit parts and one of them was the gardener. I made some decisions and took <laughs> yeah. some risks oh, yeah. on the first day of rehearsal, and he yelled at me. Really? <laughs> yeah. He was like... On the first day of yeah, rehearsal? <laughs> yeah. Because I played him a little hmm, simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he yelled at me for not showing... Like, I was being disrespectful to the character. Uh, of the and, gardener? Yeah, the gardener. He's like... This is not a simple man. He's like, <laughs> was like he Scottish? Saying he was like working class. No, my uh, director of my plays in high school was this dude, William T. Bradford. Uh huh. And he was like this, always wore khaki shorts and boat shoes and uh, went to like Notre Dame theater school and so And he talked like this. Only in America can a little black boy with a lisp and a stutter from Alabama grow up to be, a, like, a, I guess, a British guy. Because <laughs> he talked like that. <laughs> but he was great. He was uh, a really big influence in my life. That's One cool. of the big reasons I'm a What do you performer. think? Is he still alive? I don't think so. Ooh, but I oh. apologize if he is. Oh, R.I.P. to Mr. Bradford. William, William T. Bradford. Bradford. Billy Bradford. Billy Bradford. That's what yeah. We if you got him. that name, you got to go with Billy. Billy T. Billy T. Billy, Billy T. T. It works on every level. Billy Bradford. Built. 
<laughs> one of the plays in high school I did, I was the part was like a drunk, a drunkard. Whoa! But like cool. I had never been drunk before. If I would watch it now, that performance, I would say cliche. You were hiccuping uh, a lot. Didn't even hiccup. No. Shit. Wow. You should have. All right. Up. It seems I, I want to give that role a shot, a, another shot. <laughs> yeah, let's I put it on. What play was it? It was called uh, Shahrazad. Yeah, we're gonna put on a production of Shahrazad. I think we have, <laughs> we've reserved Dynasty Typewriter in Los Angeles to do a live show on May twenty fifth. I think we scratch the podcast mm-hmm. and we do Terra Shot. Hmm. Huh. Terra shot? What is the Shahrazad? Shahrazad. Or 99 Arabian Nights? Yeah. Let's where every do it. it's like a, it's vignettes. Hey, were there any problematic costumes or makeup decisions <laughs> in that play? No makeup decisions. <laughs> okay. Costumes are really good though. Here's okay. the log line. Betrayed by his brahut. What is that word? Betra the betrothed. <laughs> <laughs> you are betrothed. Betrayed by his betrothed. The hot tempered King Raina decides to punish all the women in his kingdom. Oh God. That sounds yeah, like a play. Yeah, so in. like, yeah, that's like uh, your play. <laughs> that's not my play. <laughs> that's like your so play. Like, how did you punish them? Might as well the, be the Nolan uh, story. No, no, no. The king, <laughs> his wife cheats on him. Oh. So he's like, okay, now I, I'm going to kill every woman in my kingdom. It sounds Which, like a perfect high By the way, it seems like play. a short sighted uh, yeah. solution to the yeah. problem. It's like, there's plenty of fish in the sea, uh, not for long. Yeah. Uh, but Scheherazade very cleverly decides to, instead of uh, getting killed after the first night with the king, like every other woman, she tells him a story. Wait, so he like smashes and then kills? Yeah. Yikes. Oh, wow. This yeah. is a great high school. This is a high school play. Uh, project. Yeah. You uh, well, there wasn't the smashing. They didn't smash. Uh, just, just the murder. The smashing yeah. Just murder. In the murder sense. Um, they didn't make love to anyone. He anyway, she, she tells a story, a continuing story, to uh, make him want to keep her around longer. Oh, so she na- she talks. She talks, tells stories, and it went, and eventually it works. And oh. uh, she survives. He comes and, around. Yeah. Good. Sorry about all that murder, guys. I was a little, <laughs> yeah. a little wonky. A little, yeah. A little but you will there. bear me a son. Is that what you said to Emily? Yeah. <laughs> you will bear me a son. Do you say that every day when you get home? Yeah, and I shake her. <laughs> Jesus. That's a little counterintuitive. <laughs> Speaking of stories, let's get into ours. Yeah. All right. Oh, by the way, welcome to the show. Yeah. My name's Nolan Sykes. Hell joined yeah. as always by my friend, James Pumphrey. Get a f- your dog out of my car. <laughs> get that dog out of get there. Get that dog out of there. And... Joe Weber. Uh, what's up, Wink Wink Nation? How you doing, Joe? I'm doing great today. Good. I've been tired and hurt this whole week, but <laughs> today selling Johnny been great. Cash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into it, shall we? Part two of Mazda. Here we go. Suneji Matsuda was born on November 24th, 1895, and despite being the son of the wealthy and successful Toyo Kojio president Jujira Matsuda. Suneji was no stranger to humble beginnings, okay? He spent most of his childhood growing up in a lower-income home. His father was barely 20 when he was born and spent most of his days away from home working in the factories around Osaka. Suneji was 10 when his father opened his first business in a tiny cow shed. And it wasn't it's until, always a cow shed. Always a cow shed. <laughs> and it wasn't until Suneji was in his late teens that his business endeavors began to pay off. By the time Jujiro made his fortune... Suneji was a young man and had been part of the labor force for years. Being a part of a young, struggling family and seeing the hard work and determination of his father undoubtedly left an impression on Suneji. He would carry these lessons and memories with him when he had the good fortune to be brought into Toyo Kojio in the 1920s. Suneji spent the next 20 years under his father's wing, learning how to run the business and gradually worked his way up the ranks. He witnessed the tremendous impact the Mazda Go three-wheeled truck had on the company and in the daily lives of their consumers and, like his father, believed the company's fortunes depended on embracing new technologies. So we learned about this last week. Yes. Uh, it's just a three-wheeled, three-wheeled truck motorcycle. That, that helped people work. It had a little uh-huh. bed in the back. Motorcycle uh, in the front, you, business in the back. Motorcycle yep. in the front, business in the back. It looks like uh, a motorcycle with a bucket on the back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it does. Suneji's moment to show his true leadership potential came in the aftermath of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima in August of 1945. Alongside Jujiro, he helped in the relief efforts by establishing and operating family reuniting centers, hospitals, police stations, and many other services the city desperately needed. 
The courage and undying devotion of the people of Hiroshima to build the city anew inspired him. No matter the physical and emotional scars the bomb left on the city and its people, if the city could rise from the ashes, so could he, and so could Toyo Kogio and the Mazda brand. What are they going to do then? Vehicle production roared back to life at the end of 1945, and the Mazda three-wheel trucks were buzzing around Hiroshima and other Japanese cities as a massive rebuilding effort was underway. Suneji and Jujiro were determined to build more vehicles for the Japanese people. And through the end of the 1940s and into the early 50s, the company introduced a number of utility vehicles. As his father's health declined at the beginning of the 1950s, Tsuneji prepared to take over the company's operations. He became president of Toyo Kogio in December 1951 at the age of 56, only three months before Jujiro's death. Tsuneji was determined to double down on personal transit as the company's primary focus, uh, cars. <laughs> Japan may have needed trucks now, but its economy was recovering, and he knew that Japanese consumers would soon be clamoring for cars. Just like us. We're always clamoring for Dude, cars. And we literally made a living out of clamoring for cars. All we do is clamor. Dude, that was what we should call the new podcast. <laughs> the clamoring, clamoring for, for cars. cars. The clam guys. <laughs> clam guys. Hey, guys. What's up? It's the clam guys. What's up, everybody? What's and we're up, all just everybody? like, what's up, clam basically <laughs> like wet. Wet. Yeah. S- almost sweaty, but yeah. cold. Clammy. <laughs> Clammy. In addition to revitalizing... <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, welcome, hey guys. To, well, welcome to Clamory. Guys. We're the Clam Guys. Shouts out to Clam Nation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In addition to Clams the, up. Yeah. Clams up. Chowder Nation. Chowder. What's up, Chowder Heads? What's up? Welcome to the casino. <laughs> welcome to the Clams Casino. I thought Clams Casino. Sorry for like the biggest digression What's of the all time. Sickest re- Producer, producer name, name ever. Yeah, I was like, I'm a, up. yeah, and it's amazing. Yeah, it turns it out there's is. a very famous, successful, yep. and talented producer named uh-huh. Clams Casino, one of the best. In addition to revitalizing their non vehicle manufacturing sector by producing carbide bits Ooh. and rods, okay. grinding machines that's what they used to call me at the teen club in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky, the grinding machine <laughs> and shell mold cores. That was huh. my nickname. Shell Moldcore. <laughs> That's the kind of music yeah. we used to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Shell, Shell Moldcore. Moldcore. <laughs> it's all about like gas. <laughs> yeah. Shell gas. Toyo Kogio ramped up truck production in the Mazda division. After introducing their first four-wheel trucks in 1950, they decided to innovate their three-wheel trucks. They love those three-wheel trucks. In 1954, Mazda presented the... G C Z C L Y and C H T A trucks at the first Tokyo Motor Show. They were evolutions of the Mazda Go and featured enclosed cabins, mm. more room for passengers, and varying payload capacities. By 1958, the commercial truck program had close to 30 models, Damn. ranging from small minivans to the Mazda Romper, a classic. One ton pickup. Dude. I mean, all three of these mini trucks, these they kind of look the same. Yeah, but this Mazda Romper looks like something Justin would drive. Oh, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, park it next to is a Suzu uh, yeah. Impulse. Impulse. It looks big, but it's probably like eight feet long, maybe. Yeah. Even like the Ram 1500s, those are like three quarter ton, one ton. Really? So yeah. this is a big old truck. It's a yeah. romper, yeah. Joe. It's a romper. Okay. I, okay. I eat my words. I'm going to start calling Justin romper. <laughs> romper. Rugged romper. Rugged romper. Rugged romper. Rugged, rugged romper. romper. Justin, the rugged romper. <laughs> Pretty sure rompers, you have to like take the whole thing off to go to the bathroom. Right, Christina? If you're wearing a romper, they're pretty full inc- new. Inconvenient. Inconvenient. They have, they're trying to make rompers for men. I know. I they been, they better make them with ass they flaps. <laughs> they're called coveralls. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. But no, they're like active, like. Like shorts? Shorts, yeah. They've been trying that forever. What it needs is like the classic like 49er old timey like minor butt flap with the buttons yeah, on the that's back. that's what I'm saying. Here's the thing. Yeah. I don't want like an apparatus that reminds people that I poop on my clothes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, just so everyone knows, I poop, but I'm prepared. It's like when I don't you, even like yeah. buying toilet paper 
even though I know everyone uses it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm yeah, walking yeah, through yeah. the grocery store with a big thing of toilet paper, just being like, I'm hey, going to shit later. Yeah. I poop so much, I used the last one. <laughs> everyone knows it's not my first time buying it, and they know I've at least pooped that many times. Well, you should get that um, organic toilet paper that you wash in your washer. After what? No. no. I'm just kidding. I'd oh, rather can you die. imagine? I was like, does that <laughs> like, Someone was like, about? hey, you have to use <laughs> handkerchiefs to wipe your butt from now on. I'd be like, shoot me. Yeah. <laughs> I want to just. It's, it's not worth it's it. Over with and done. Yeah, yeah. man. Literally get it. Send it away from my house. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, I don't want to have to take it out. I want tubes to take it out of my <laughs> yeah, house. Like those, yeah, yeah. Like at the yeah. bank. It's like. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah, I poop in a tiny I want to do it in a tiny lake that gets taken into a, a underground lake. tunnel system. Full of shit. Yeah. I just watched a recreation of how Romans used to poop. Yeah, and on, it was like on slaves. Yeah. <laughs> what? No. Used to poop it on was slaves. like a bathhouse and they're all the they were all in a row on a bench Mm -hmm. and then there was this little tiny like river of constantly flowing water and they Uh had this big like stick with the rag on it and they would dip the stick and then they would like wipe it under. Yeah. That was the toilet paper. Really? Yeah. Oh You have your own stick. You're not going to carry that around with you. I would make my own stick. Gross. (laughs) Romans suck. We should emulate them as much as possible. Yeah. Let's be like Romans. Yeah. Bring back the stick. Yeah. Bring back this stick. (laughs) Delegalize weed. Bring back the yeah, stick. Yeah, D-legalize weed. Bring, bring back, back sharing back. a poop stick poop with stick. strangers. Yeah, public toilets. Public no toilets. No dividers. Can no you imagine dividers. how much Europeans would hate us? They hate us that there's a gap. No, Europeans would be into it. No, mm. they hate that there's a gap. Europeans yeah. shit on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a European toilet? They're awful. There's like 90 feet between you. and There's no water in them even. Europeans, we had a weird Europeans cannot they, they can say a lot of stuff about Americans, not about our plumbing. No, we like our we got good plumbing. <laughs> yeah, we had a weird good. toilet situation in France where it was up on like a little pedestal in the bathroom, yep. but the bathroom itself was like only three feet wide. Yeah. And I'm just like if a European ever tries to talk about our plumbing or our bathroom situation, World War Three. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing in your schedule is to know what's important to you and to make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. I think therapy is super important for everyone. I don't think anyone has all their stuff figured out. And I think BetterHelp is the best way to get into therapy if you've never done it before. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash PassGas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash PassGas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Big thank you to Subaru for sponsoring this episode. For anyone who believes that life is about the journey, not the destination, discover the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness. Adventure is a big part of an active lifestyle, but sometimes you gotta push it to the edge. The Subaru Crosstrek has always appealed to the adventure seekers with its legendary standard symmetrical all-wheel drive. But now, the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness goes even further. An enhanced dual-function X-Mode combined with 9.3 inches of ground clearance gives increased capability. Tough new off-road wheels with all-terrain tires designed for even more daunting trails. This trusty Subaru is built to take you to the limit, and yet its retuned standard EyeSight driver assist technology is there to watch over you. Bold accent colors and new rugged exterior houses its equally durable water-repellent StarTech seats in a surprisingly spacious cabin. When I saw Subaru first introduce their wilderness line, I was like, when are they gonna do the Crosstrek? And now since it's been revealed, dude, this thing looks dope. Give it a look. This thing is super versatile and capable. It's at home, on the road, or out in the bush, helping you with your camping trip. The Wilderness is the top of the Crosstrek range. You're not going to be able to buy a more capable Crosstrek from the dealer. you got to go with the Wilderness. Discover the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness, the newest member of Subaru's Wilderness family. Adventure on the edge. Learn more at Subaru.com. EyeSight is a driver assist system that may not operate optimally under all driving conditions. The driver is responsible for safe and attentive driving. System effectiveness depends on many factors. See your owner's manual. In terms of sheer vehicle volume... Mazda managed to outsell Toyota, 
and Nissan Whoa. in the 1950s. In the final years of the 50s, Tuneji oversaw the R360 Coupe project. Mazda's first car that they would bring to market. Oh, this is a and tiny little guy. What a cutie. Oh, wow. It looks like Pluto drives it. Yeah, it's very uh, cartoonish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's cute. To design the car, Tsuneji, in the spirit of his father, and one that would come to define the company, turned to the most cutting-edge technologies available. He invested in computers. Hmm. Computers! What? To aid with the production management, becoming wow. one of the first automakers to do so. What? And implemented the use of magnesium and aluminum alloys to cut down on wow. the car's weight. So he's just like punching cards. Yeah. To yeah. Like it really must have been like that sort of system. Yeah. Uh, you know, entire floors of buildings taken up with whatever is, computing. Yeah. In the 50s, computers used to be run by these tiny dogs that are actually extinct now. <laughs> but they would run on these little wheels to power the computers. Yeah. And then, and then, the and then they would punch. They would use their teeth to punch the cards <laughs> yeah. that would They're extinct save now stuff. Because when we didn't need them, we just thought of them as like computer parts. And we yeah. Didn't, keep reading them but they were also trained when they got tired they would sit on your feet <laughs> and then bill gates was like hey why don't we use electricity <laughs> the rest is history yeah and the reason that apples called apples because they the dogs fed them apples. apples yeah yeah mm -hmm. yep great don't look it up the r360 was unveiled in 1960 follow the money it was immediately one of the best cars available in Japan's lightweight K class of vehicles. This was back when it wasn't 600 cc; it was 360 cc, mm. which is why the Subaru 360. No, yeah. mm. same thing. Yeah, same engine displacement. Dude, uh, the a lot of the world was designed for cars not to go 100 miles an hour. I know, like your neighborhood, like the it's insane. Like the on ramps are like 30 feet long. I like doing a big. Burnout getting onto the freeway. Yeah, big old Bernie. Yeah. I mean, they're not that big. Just skid, yeah. skids a little bit, though. It's fun. Cops come get Nolan. <laughs> yeah. In addition to its low price, the lightweight alloys also paid dividends for the car's performance in a class with heavily restricted engine sizes. It also had powertrain options considered luxuries for its class, including an automatic transmission hmm. and a four stroke engine. Mm. <laughs> Instead of two? Yeah. Cool. The car was an immediate success and sold 4,500 units on launch day. In August 1961, Mazda began to consolidate their vast truck line when they launched B-Series. The truck would prove to be a huge success for Mazda over the years and would be produced in various iterations until the early 2000s. Oh, no kidding. That was like the uh, Ford Ranger. Yeah. It became the Ford Ranger. Nice. Cool. But despite the successes of the R360, the B-Series, and their innovative computer manufacturing processes, Mazda had a problem. During this time period, the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry was pressuring small manufacturers to merge with larger ones to increase their global competitiveness. If Mazda were to survive as an independent company, it would need to demonstrate a uniqueness that proved its worth and need to manage itself. I guess that kind of makes sense. But for smaller companies, that sucks. Yeah. I guess that's the thesis of this part of this story. <laughs> I'll uh, continue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, allow me to explain. <laughs> to accomplish this, Suneji had its sights fixed on the Wankel rotary engine, a revolutionary lightweight engine design with a compact size and high power potential that used triangular rotors rather than traditional piston technology. By the early 1960s, Several types of rotary engines had been in development, but none had proven capable of running for more than a short while. As a result, the rotary had developed a reputation of being nothing more than dream technology. Yeah, like a robot who can kiss like a real person. <laughs> yeah. They just haven't gotten the lips right. I yeah. know. They never get the lips right. <laughs> in 1961, Mazda sent an engineering team to NSU Modewirken in West Germany. This was a company that had secured the patent rights to the Wankel engine, or Wankel engine. During their time at NSU, they studied the engine and reported what they had found back to Mazda. The reports weren't exactly promising and documented a major flaw. After only a few hours of running, the rotor housing would be scarred by what NSU called chatter marks, 
which were horizontal grooves cut into the perimeter of the rotor housing by the seals on the apexes of the rotors. So that would basically not make it a vacuum anymore, right? Mm -hmm. They're just like clanking around. Clanking. And you get chatter marks. Yeah. And it's not airtight. Yeah. But Suneji was convinced that this was the technology Mazda needed to save itself and later that same year signed a licensing agreement with NSU for the rights to produce the engine. Then he formed a 47-person rotary research department to perfect the design. And to lead the team, he turned to engineer Kenichi Yamamoto. Regular past gas listeners like yourself may remember Kenichi from our episode on the Miata. He is a crucial component to the history of Mazda, and the story of the company is impossible to tell without him. So here's a quick refresher on his background. Kenichi Yamamoto's family moved to Hiroshima when he was a child, and he was considered to be a brilliant from a young age. He obtained a degree in mechanical engineering from Tokyo Imperial University as a young adult. He served in the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War II. He returned to Hiroshima shortly after the war concluded. And although Kenichi's parents had survived the bombing of the city, his sister and the family home had not, and Kenichi decided to stay in the city to support his parents. He had found a job working with Mazda after returning home, initially assembling transmissions on the factory floor. But due to his educated background, and a demonstrated curiosity in studying blueprints and testing the designs at Mazda, he was moved into the engine design department. And over the next decade, he swiftly rose through the ranks of management. Kenichi knew the importance of the Rotary Research Department's success. In a 1985 interview with the New York Times, in which they described Kenichi as a slim and intense engineer, <laughs> he stated, quote, that this was no mere publicity stunt. Toyo Kojio existence was at stake. Jerry's kind of a slim and intense yeah. engineer. Oh, yeah. He yeah. definitely is. <laughs> slim and intense yeah. engineer. With a soft... Southern soft. drawl. Yeah. yeah. According to Mazda, Kenichi ran the department with a feverish, militaristic mindset. He compared the team to the Shiju Shichi Shi, or 47 Ronin, a legendary group of 47 samurai who dedicated their lives to avenging the unjust death of their master with unparalleled loyalty and perseverance. Dang. So obvious parallels to building a car. <laughs> <laughs> he told his engineers from now on, the rotary engine must be on your minds at all times, whether you're sleeping or awake. I don't think I would survive at this company. No. <laughs> I mean, that's how the podcast is though. Yeah, that's how our yeah, podcast is. I do think is. about the podcast yeah. 24 hours a day. Yeah. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, uh, inflection. Uh, 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 <laughs> projection. <laughs> inflection. Projection. Unique New York. Unique New York. Unique New York. We are constantly avenging our master. <laughs> <laughs> the team struggled for two years to make progress on the chatter mark issue. Can you imagine spending two years being like, we still got chatter marks? Yeah. <laughs> and then, we and got them. Then, then they hired Shuji Apex. Then they hired, <laughs> then they hired that lady from that play Nolan did. Because she knew all about chatter. <laughs> they fixated on the apex <laughs> on the apex seal material first and seemingly exhausted their options. At one point, they even tried to use horse and cow bones. What? I can see how because it's like soft but hard. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> soft but hard. <laughs> Uh, mechanical engineering schools followed the team's struggles, which sparked academic debates on whether or not the problem could ever be solved. That's pretty cool. I like that. Wow. I watched a Veritasium video on blue LEDs. Mm. On mm -hmm. why they're almost impossible yeah. to make. Yeah. It's really good. It's in my watch list, it's let's just say. pretty impressive. And proof that you can get very granular and get a ton of views. Mm hmm it's, I mean, that's all of his videos. Yeah, just like so. What like, a master. So granular. As time passed and a forced merger seemed imminent, Toyo Kojio leadership was growing more impatient. And they began to view the team as little more than a money pit. Which is our Mazda series. Follow the m money pit. <laughs> In 1963, <laughs> a breakthrough was made when an engineer suggested changing the seal's shape rather than focusing on the material. Hmm. This took years. <laughs> be like, what about the shape? I don't know. It's pretty good as a bone shape. <laughs> <laughs> and we got all these cow bones because we're in this cow shed. 
<laughs> Several new designs were tested before the team found success using a cross hollow seal with a cross shaped hole near the apex. Oh yeah. I could so easily picture this in my mind. No, well it I'm is rotating this shape in my mind's eye right now. It's like a, every angle. Yeah. 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 Um, my urethra. <laughs> <laughs> The next year, alongside manufacturing partner Nippon Carbon Co., Mazda turned their attention back to the material used for the Apex seal and settled on an aluminum carbon composite for longevity. Speaking of shapes, Joe, yesterday we were talking, maybe the day before, about Volvo's flower piston. Yes. Uh -huh. Did you see a picture of it? Uh, I saw videos of it. Yeah. It's actually been around for a while oh, okay. in Volvo's diesel truck engines. Oh, all right. Yeah. Why is it just getting attention now? I have no idea. Maybe they're putting in gas engines. I don't know. But it, like, yeah. apparently it increases fuel efficiency by a whopping 2%. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was uh, Which, in more, trucking, revolution, well, more revolutionary than that. They were first talking about it like seven years ago. So I, maybe they've made a new breakthrough in terms of shape and combustion. I just think it's that. cool that you can kind of like direct the exhaust and the pressure mm -hmm. using the shape of the piston but it's uh, like thinking about it now it's you know it's pretty cool though yeah shapes shapes speaking <laughs> of shapes a car soon to begin to take shape <laughs> around this new radical hey. engine so Neji planned a surprise reveal of the prototype at the tokyo motor show in october 1963 where the car made its public debut to the surprise of both the crowd and the Mazda team. If there could ever be a second pride of Hiroshima after the Mazda Go, this was surely it. At the Tokyo Motor Show the following year, the car was officially announced as an in-development for production. But the car wasn't quite finished. Mm. And Kenichi and his team were still sorting out problems arising from real-world testing. If it were to go to market as quickly as Mazda wanted it to, the testing would need to be done as comprehensively and efficiently as possible. So Neji had an idea. Mazda would send the prototypes to dealers across Japan and ask them to take them out for test drives, reporting any problems they encountered. He told Kenichi and his team, quote, with the cooperation of dealers, we will be able to obtain practical, useful data. If we fail after coming this far, it will be said that the rotary engine is useless. That would be regrettable. I wonder why they picked the rotary as this money pit to just keep developing. Because they needed to be unique. And like, oh, we can't merge with a larger company yeah. because we don't make piston engines. They may just make oh. piston engines. We make rotaries. I was going to say, if you want to be unique, just like design a unique body, you know? Mm -hmm, but I think still even then... Like it would be easily mm -hmm. uh, reproduced. Yeah. The testing went on for over a year and was a resounding success. Dozens of rotary powered cars were being driven on the roads across Japan by enthusiastic car dealers who had the added incentive of reporting information quickly and accurately to ensure the car's success. Anytime a problem occurred, Kenichi's engineers would swoop in, diagnose the causes of the issue, develop a fix, and send the vehicles back to dealers for more testing. This semi-public testing also created a buzz for Mazda in the automotive media. Yeah, that's actually pretty good marketing. Yeah, pretty good marketing, I'd say. On May 30th, 1967, the world's first rotary-powered mass production car, the Mazda Cosmo Sport, called the 110S Abroad, was debuted to the public after six arduous years of development. Rather than put the engine into a family car, Mazda chose a sports car. Its two-rotor, 1,000cc engine made 108 horsepower and can propel the Cosmo to 115 mile per hour top speed. The engine was no longer a fantasy technology or an academic argument. Mazda had solved the rotary engine and in doing so saved themselves from a forced merger. Let's go. They yeah. were unique. <laughs> we are unique now. We are unique <laughs> now. I do really like how this looks. It's got like um, oh, great Thunderbird cars. meets Jaguar vibes. Yes. Yes. As the 60s came to a close, Tsuneji looked back on the decade as a resounding success. 
Not only had Mazda launched their first passenger car, a successful B-Series truck, and the world's first rotary-powered car, but they had also successfully entered the compact and mid-sized car market with the Carol. <laughs> okay. And the Familia. Ooh. Oh, Carol looks kind of funky. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Carol's it does look funky. Really, it looks like a lighter. It's like a <laughs> oververt notchback. And they entered their first car-based racing event with a Carol in the 1964 Japanese Grand Prix. They had grown quickly, with production numbers doubling from 1 million to 2 million units a year from 1963 to 1966. They had also launched a flagship luxury car, the Luce, or the 1500. Luce is Italian for light. Yep. In Hmm. a collaboration with Italian designer Gruppo Bertone. Gruppo. The car broke with the box-shaped design mold in Japan and had a first-in-class overhead cam engine. Nice. In 1967, coinciding with the launch of the Cosmo, Mazda began full-scale exporting to Europe for the first time. Yeah, they, they do look like European cars. They do. You can definitely tell the influence. I'm going to be honest. They look right at home on the streets of Rome. Yeah. That's a really good-looking car. The Luce? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It later became the Mazda 929. Mm. Oh, so it was the bigger, it was the bigger big boy luxury car. All right. The seventies would be a decade of transition and adaptability for Mazda, who finally found themselves a competitor on the world stage. In one of his last acts as president of Toyo Kojio, Suneji entered into a partnership with Ford and Nissan before he passed away at an age of 74 on November 15th, 1970. His eldest son, Kohei, took over as president shortly thereafter. With a new partnership with Ford, more Mazdas were finding their way into the U.S., including its B-Series truck, which was being sold as the Ford Courier, which my grandpa had one of these things. Really? Yeah. It's probably still at at their house right now. Ooh, take that. Put a freaking coyote under that hood. Oh, my God, dude. You get me so excited. Or 13B. Or 13B. But just a big old freaking big block. Freaking big old meats in the back. Do wheelies. The brand's rotary powered cars, though, were its true claim to fame, still, and Mazda doubled down on their production, continuing to fund Kenichi's team to further their innovation. In 1970, the company showcased the RX500 concept wow. car, a 150 mile per hour rotary powered supercar with a 247 horsepower engine and a 15,000 RPM redline. What? what? This was to showcase their advancements with the technology. And one technology. giant wiper blade. Oh man, I love this thing. There's very there's a weird 70s. like in the seventies. There was a bunch of cars that kind of look like this. Mm-hmm. There's like the bulldog, the Aston Martin mm-hmm. bulldog. Remember mm-hmm. that? Yep. Uh, just like almost like panel van cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, very wedge. Uh, Lotus Salon has this kind of shape as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Pretty weird. Pretty funky. Pretty funky. Pretty weird. Mazda also began to utilize rotaries in their other cars, including the compact RX-2 pickup trucks, the flagship Lucha, and the minibuses. In 1971... I took the minibus. <laughs> <laughs> when cool. I was in junior high, we had our improv team in our th- advanced theater class, mm-hmm. and my friend Connor, he was like in a, a motorized wheelchair, so we had mm-hmm. to take a short bus to like That's all cool. the elementary schools that we went to to perform. Yeah. Yeah. Was he funny? Yeah, dude, Connor's hilarious. Hell yeah. Yeah. In 1971, Kenichi's team replaced the Cosmo with the Mazda Savannah, which would prove to be just as important as their first rotary-powered car. Mazda had grand ideals associated with the car from the very beginning. Its name comes from the Steamboat Savannah, the first steam-powered ship to cross the Atlantic, as well as the NS Savannah, the world's first nuclear-powered merchant ship. Do you think NS stands for nuclear ship? No, I forget. It's... Some British naming term, right? HMS. Oh, it's like HMS. NS, USS. That's the US, obviously. I don't know what the NS is. Nuclear nu- ship. It is. It's I call it. for nuclear <laughs> ship. Got it. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, man. <laughs> you were so sure. I'm yeah. just striking out. <laughs> yeah. Every, that is at every, so literally every turn this week, I've strike, struck out. 
How are we supposed to believe anything else you've said? In I don't this know. Episode? That's that's the problem, Jake. Did therein, Mazdi even make a call? Therein yeah. lies the issue. Didn't. All right, my headphones are back on. Here we go. Okay, so I apologize, listener. Yeah. NS stands for nuclear ship. It does. It stands for nuclear Sorry, ship. Sorry, Joe. USS stands for United States ship. I apologize, Joe. And HMS is Her Majesty's service? Ship. I don't know. I'm not going to comment <laughs> on anything today. The Savannah was an immediate success. HMS stands for Her Majesty's ship. I no know ship. ships. Wow. <laughs> no, not service. Ship. Oh. Stands for Her Majesty's I guess ship. I don't know. Looks That's like the so last simple. S stands is ship. ship. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Learning a lot today. The Mazda Savannah was an immediate success, and more than well, half now it of stands buyers. For His Majesty's ship. Oh yeah, Harry's magic ship. <laughs> uh, William, do you guys not even pay attention to the royal family? I don't give a shit. <laughs> oh my god, I don't give a shit. More than half of uh, Savannah buyers were well, trading where you cars. Came from guys, I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, get where you freaking came from, guys. More than half of Savannah buyers were trading in cars from other manufacturers. In 1972, the Savannah received the updated 12A engine and entered in the Japanese Touring Car Championship, where it would go head-to-head with Japan's undefeated touring car of the time, the Nissan Skyline GTR. Uh, the Savannah... Qu- yeah. <laughs> Get this. The Savannah quickly replaced the Skyline as the dominant car on the grid, and by 1976, it had recorded its 100th win in just four wait. seasons. How come people don't talk about this car? Yeah. This is sick. No one's talking about oh, this no, car. Oh, no, it's pretty sick. Why are no one scared to talk about this car? It this is, is cool. such a flex for people to turn in their new cars to get a Mazda. You know, like if you were buying a Toyota or a Nissan at the time. Mm, yeah. Because yeah. you're not only like selling more than your competitor, you're taking away business actively. Yeah. I will say the, the Savannah touring car, uh, very muscle car like in its yes. design. Like, just like the GTR. Yeah, like the GTR. Would yeah. you call this a Coke bottle shape? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a Coke bottle yeah. shape. Oh, Wide yeah. hips. I like my women and my cars the same shape. <laughs> I like my women, my horses, and my cars the same shape. Coke bottle. <laughs> horses? Yeah. Coke bottle shaped horse, big old hips. Ever heard of a Palomino Joe? You ever heard of a Palomino Joe? Ever heard of an Arabian horse? You ever heard of a quarter horse, yeah. Joe? How many horses do you even know, dude? Quarter horse, uh, Dutch. That Dutch, Dutch quarter horse. horse. Uh, the <laughs> Afghan. You're a fake horse, horse guy, dude. You're a fake horse guy. <laughs> Big thanks to Electric E-Bikes for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. No matter how you're approaching 2024, Electric E-Bikes can help you go the distance. From commutes to adventures, riders of all abilities can explore this new year with Electric E-Bikes. Go to electricebikes.com to learn more about their wide selection of e-bikes that start at just $7.99. That's electric, L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E, bikes.com. So Electric sent me an XP 3.0, which is their flagship electric bike. It's super cool. It folds up, gets real small, goes up to like 24 miles per hour just with the throttle, which is so fun. It's got this really cool rack on the back I can put groceries on. I've been having a lot of fun with the XP 3 riding around my neighborhood. So if you're interested, getting started on adventures is easier than ever. It ships free, comes fully assembled and foldable for easy travel and storage. Explore 2024 with Electric E-Bikes, the most accessible and adventurous e-bikes ever. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more and be sure to mention that Pass Gas by Donut Media sent you in the post-checkout survey. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E bikes.com. Big thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Selling a little or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing, however your cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your little online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way up to, did we just hit half a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. What I love about Shopify is that it gives you control 
control over how you grow your business. This is the kind of tool that I'm looking for if I'm going to start a business. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash gas. Thanks, Shopify. Big thanks to Chime for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. It's a new year, and with the new year comes some new things you want to buy. Maybe something you didn't get for Christmas that you really wanted. Something that you would put on a credit card. So no matter how you're starting off the year, when you use the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can build your credit scores with on-time payments for everyday purchases. If there were an overachieving credit card that helps you build credit, this would be it. Some of the best aspects of the Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card are that there's no annual fees, interest, or credit check to apply, and you can build credit using your own money. Plus, you can get paid up to two days early with direct deposit. And there's 60,000 fee-free ATMs you can use, which is huge. I always hate paying like 350 to get my own money out. So start building your credit. Open a Chime checking account with at least a $200 qualifying direct deposit to get started. Get started at chime.com slash gas. That's chime.com slash gas. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by the Bancorp Bank, NA, or Stride Bank, NA, members FDIC. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal and over-the-counter advance fees may apply. Call one 844 6363 for details. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. While the Savannah was bringing success on the track through the early and mid-70s, things began to look bleak elsewhere. 1973 was a particularly bad year for Mazda and was a prelude of more problems to come. Mazda entered their first Le Mans event, but failed to have a single car finish. A few months later in October, the, that pesky oil crisis. Oh, it's been a while since we've talked about it, the oil yeah, crisis. It is. Yeah. I forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> Japanese manufacturers like Toyota and Honda saw the popularity of their small and efficient cars rise through this period, particularly in places like the United States. Yep. Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> That's, That's where us, we live. <laughs> this was a place that had domestic markets inundated with large and inefficient vehicles. But the rotary, which had saved Mazda only a few years prior, was now its Achilles heel. Despite its compact size, it made the power of a much larger engine and had the poor fuel economy to show for it. Mazda sales dropped dramatically, and by 1975, the company was operating at a huge deficit and was forced to reduce production volume and sell some of its assets. To complicate matters further, management had reached an impasse on the direction of the company. Many in management wanted to abandon the rotary altogether, but Kenichi, who had been promoted to head of research and development by the mid-70s, was determined to fight for it. I mean, he had personally spent a lot of time yeah. with it. It makes sense that he was invested in it. It's like his baby. It's his baby, yeah. He recounted to the New York Times in the 1980s that he was under immense pressure to refocus on traditional piston engines, but, quote, he was adamant that the company could not abandon the breakthrough technology that set it apart from its competitors. He told the Times he believed, quote, it would have announced to the world that what we had started doing was not good, and then we wouldn't have been able to succeed at anything, even just selling the piston engine. In the end, though, both sides got what they wanted. Mazda shifted its primary focus to the more proven piston engine, and Kenichi was able to keep the rotary alive. He launched the Phoenix program in the mid-70s, an R&D project focused on improving the fuel efficiency of the rotary engine. And within a year, they had succeeded in improving its fuel economy by nearly 40%. That's crazy. Whoa. Rotary engines would never be the primary focus again, but thanks to Kenichi, they would continue to define the brand and keep the technological spirit of the Matsuda family alive, even as Kohei Matsuda stepped down from the presidency, ending a long run of the family's leadership at Mazda. The rotary was primed for a relaunch, and it would be packaged in what is arguably Mazda's most legendary car, the RX-7. Nice. Oh, yeah, I keep forgetting. It was in Savannah. Yeah, the Savannah RX-7 was released in 1978 and was a major success. The improved fuel economy and exhilarating performance of the 13B engine won over journalists and consumers alike. The racing version also had huge success at the track, winning an unprecedented 100 victories in the American IMSA series against cars like the Nissan 240Z and 
the venerable Porsche 911. Wow. Whoa. Those are two cars you want to beat. Yeah. yeah. Those are two cars I like, boy. <laughs> <laughs> The 70s could have ended in disaster for Mazda, but just as they had in the 60s, the company adapted and thrived. And by the end of the decade, Ford was convinced in the company's future and increased their stake to 25%. Okay. Mazda also celebrated their 10 millionth vehicle in 1979, up from a mere 200,000 in 1957. Jeez Louise. Small company, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> Throughout the 1980s, Mazda continued to make its imprint on global car culture. In 1981, the RX-7 made its way to races in Europe and took home the first ever win by a Japanese manufacturer at the 24 Hours of Spa. Nice. Mazda also became the first Japanese manufacturer to get an overall round win in the second round of the 1987 World Rally Championship in a 3-2-3. This thing's sick. Yeah, these are sick. I didn't realize they looked like that back then. Cool little car. Mazda became even more involved with Ford, supplying them with car and truck platforms, diesel engines, and automatic transmissions. It also continued to make a name for itself among enthusiasts with the RX-7, particularly with the second-generation FC. The FC was praised for its cutting-edge technology coming from Kenichi's R&D department, including an adaptive suspension system that could actively adjust the toe of the wheels and shock firmness based on the load generated from cornering, braking, and accelerating. Whoa. This provided agility at low speed and stability at high speed. It was also one of the first cars to utilize electronic power steering. Interesting. In 1984... The company officially changed its name from Toyo Kogio to Mazda Motor Corporation. The car brand had long since become the most recognizable brand of the company, and the name held dual purpose of both honoring the Matsuda family and signifying they were going all in on the automobile. Then, over the next few years, the company would create yet another icon for the road. The Mazda Miata, also known as the Roadster and MX-5, is widely recognized as a sports car in its purest form. They're the darlings of everything from casual track days to absurd engine swaps. As many will tell you, if you're looking for a fun car, Miata is always the answer. I just saw a Koenigsegg post where Christian von Koenigsegg's like, in his early 20s with uh-huh. his girlfriend. Yeah. And he has hair. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Uh, and like a really sick Mazda with some like wide wheels on the back. Really? And it looks really cool. As we mentioned earlier, Pass Gas has covered the Miata in detail before, but if you missed it, here is a quick history. Kenichi met with an American automotive journalist named Bob Hall in the late 1970s, and the two became friends. Kenichi posed two questions to Bob that he would often ask other car enthusiasts. One, where should Mazda go next? And two, what should we make? Bob lamented that the simplistic British Roadster didn't exist anymore and that Mazda should make a new one. A few years later, 1981, Bob got a job with Mazda of North America in product planning and research, working on the B-Series truck. Kenichi paid a surprise visit and asked, what about your lightweight sports car? Why don't you study that? You got, I got a lightweight sports car. Can, Can you, you study me? that? Can you study that, Greg? <laughs> Bob wrote an essay on the matter, and his argument managed to reach the desk of the company executives in Hiroshima. It was eventually time for Kenichi to give it the green light. And after two engineers arranged for him to drive a Triumph Spitfire through the mountains on his way to Tokyo, he was sold on a Roadster project. That's sick. Kenichi arranged a contest between the Japanese and North American teams to design the final product. The North American team went with a classic front-engine rear-drive Roadster concept, while the Japanese team developed both front-engine front-wheel drive and mid-engine rear-wheel drive hardtop. Dude, that mid-engine Miata? Things still exist, those prototypes. Yeah. Jimmy has one. Yeah. (laughs) The North American team won, and in 1989, the Mazda MX-5, or Unus Roadster debuted and marked the revival of the classic lightweight sports car. I'm glad they didn't go with Eunice. Eunice sounds like a big milk person. (laughs) This is my cousin Eunice. Hello. 
Today, the Miata continues to be a fixture of the brand and one of the most beloved cars of all time. In the footsteps of his father, Suneji had continued Mazda's use of -of state-of-the-art technology to carry the company in the future. They had been one of the first manufacturers to utilize computer production management and went all in on an unproven technology to save the company from a forced merger. Together with Kenichi Yamamoto, the two ensured that the fantasy technology became a reality and ensured the company's independence. After Suneji's death, Kenichi carried on his legacy, an innovative spirit of the Matsuda family. He is arguably one of the most important persons in Mazda's history, having created and saved the brand's iconic rotary engine and overseeing the development of the RX-7 and the Miata, two cars that continue to symbolize the best of the brand today. Kenichi passed away at the age of 95 at his home near Tokyo on December 20th, 2017. In the decades leading up to the Mazda we know today, a growing tuner culture would increasingly become synonymous with the brand. One particular tuning outfit would catch the attention of Mazda, and their expertise would be seen as invaluable. And together, they would take on Le Mans. Le Mans. And that's where we'll pick up next week in part three in our four-part series, The History of Mazda. What a big old honker of a story this is. Yes, sir. All right, Joe. We got some listener mail. Yeah. It starts with, yo. Whoa. First off, love the podcast and the videos. Everyone at Donut is constantly killing it and spreading the good word of cars. Thank nice. you. Thank you. I'm a fabricator and currently restore vintage sport ca- sports cars and Land Rovers for a living. Nice. And my ADHD brain needs a constant stream of information all the time to stay focused. Nice. Your podcast is definitely the first choice for that. Nice. nice. Thank you. I have a topic I think you guys should look into. Sort of in the spirit of Smokey Eunuch and if he, if he was more Machiavellian. His oh. name is Junior Johnson. And he was a wild dickhead when it came to breaking rules. Okay. It may it might make a fun episode. I don't know. I, I get paid to hit cars with a hammer. So <laughs> anyways, love you from New York. You bagels suck, Matt. Hey. Whoa. What uh, the heck, dude? Unnecessary, Matt. What we're going to check heck? out Junior Johnson. We'll look into it. And if it's a good story, we'll make an episode. Yeah. And if you love listening to this podcast while you work and Once a week just isn't enough for you. Make sure you check out our new podcast, The Big Three. Uh, It's another weekly podcast with the three of us hosting where we talk about the weekly news in cars, more current events of cars, and a whole lot more goofing. We'll talk about uh, some racing. We'll talk about some goofy stuff and goof around. And uh, new car models coming up. Don't forget, builds. they'll be goofing. Yeah. We'll be goofing. Yeah, but we're also going to do some good reporting, too. Oh, it's going to be it's tight like, reporting. It's news. Don't, don't think it's going to be all goofing. Yeah. It's going to be some real tight reporting. All right. Follow James at James Pumphrey on all social media. At Kentucky Cobra on TikTok, right? Yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter. No, he does it. All right. Uh, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> follow, J- follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. I don't make reels. A uh, big thank you to our <laughs> <laughs> producer. Uh, producer is Christina Felsky, Gavin Kinzel, and of course, Nick G. Musso behind the camera. Follow Nolan on Blue Sky. Yeah, you can if you want. I've made one post. What's Blue Sky? <laughs> is that like a it's cowboy like a- TikTok? Before oh. Threads, it was like the Twitter alternative. Yeah, when okay. uh, Elon bought it. Yeah, uh, Elon. It's interesting. It's oh. alright. It's not as funny as Twitter was. No, Twitter was sick. Anyway, see you later. Later. <laughs>